Okay. So good afternoon and welcome to the Big Data Pilot Demo Days. Uh, today is the Policy Cloud for Policies Against Radicalization. We're giving people a few minutes, a few seconds to, to join. Uh, we have a very full uh, program, so we, we'd like to get started quite quickly. Um, let's see, people are joining. Okay, just giving you a few more seconds to join and, uh, and then we can start. And it's already uh, 2nd of July, very warm in some parts of Europe. So uh, thanks for joining. Um, okay, so let's get started. Uh, so welcome to the Big Data Pilot Demo Day. So today is, uh, is uh, the turn of Policy Cloud uh, with uh, policies uh, against radicalization. Um, so um, this uh, webinar is featuring Armin Duza from Maggioli and Pavlos Granis from Linux Scale. Uh, my name is Marika Williams from Trust IT uh, and I'll be moderating today's uh, webinar. I'm uh, the communication dissemination lead for Policy Cloud, but I also have another hat from Big Data Stack, which is one of the other projects that is joining in this series of Big Data Pilot Demo Days. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. Today we are very excited to share with you uh, the Policy Cloud and uh, Analytics as a Service facilitating efficient data-driven public policy management in the case of our pilot of policies against radicalization. So prior to getting started, uh, I'd like to review a few technical details pertaining to the webinar. So you are in listen-only mode. That means that you can hear me, you can hear the speakers, but we can't hear you. Um, this, uh, this prevents everyone on the line from hearing any unnecessary background noise. Um, and, but we'd like to invite you to comment uh, with us and ask us questions uh, in the Q&A uh, uh, part of the, of the uh, Zoom platform. You'll find that uh, at the bottom of this uh, platform. Um, so we're, we're happy, very happy to take your questions there. We'll try to answer them uh, at that moment. And even uh, there is a, a way that we can unmute you so that after uh, our presentations, we can have a, a discussion on, uh, on maybe the challenges that you are facing in your own uh, organization that, uh, that, that uh, are linked to, uh, to policy cloud uh, solutions. Um, so we plan on answering all the questions, but if there's too many questions, we can always follow up uh, offline, of course. Um, the sessions uh, are being recorded, the, the whole session is being recorded uh, and also the slides uh, together with these recordings will be made uh, available after, um, after the, the session. So this is today's agenda. Um, so we're going to talk, I'll give you a brief overview of what these big data demo days are. Uh, it's, a, it's a joint effort by Big Data Stack, IBDAS, Track and Now and Policy Cloud. Uh, then we'll dive into uh, participatory policies to prevent and counter radicalization with Armand Duza from Maggioli. Uh, then we'll talk about policy cloud analytics as a service facilitating efficient and data-driven policy management by Pavlos Kranas from Linux Scale. And then uh, there's the invitation to the next big data demo day. Uh, and then of course we'll, we'll have uh, um, the time to go into questions and answers. So first, uh, I would like to tell you a little bit about, uh, about this series. So the BDV PPP Summit 2020, uh, we all submitted uh, our sessions for that, but then it went, then COVID-19 came, came along and uh, well, this, this uh, urged the BDV to, uh, to go virtual. Uh, this also provided us with a, with a great opportunity at the same time to, uh, for, at least for Policy Cloud, uh, to, to start to get to know a little bit more of, uh, of the whole BDV uh, community that's out there uh, for the very young project of Policy Cloud. Uh, so, but why these big data pilot demo days? Well, uh, the, sorry, get this better. So the new data-driven industrial revolution highlights the need uh, for big data technologies to unlock the potential in various application domains. Uh, then the BDV PPP projects, IBDAS, Big Data Stack, and Track and Know um, will deliver uh, innovative te technologies to address the emerging needs uh, and data operations and applications. Uh, and then to fully exploit uh, uh, the sustainability and the 
develop technology in each of these projects, uh, the, uh, the pilots onboarded pilots that uh, exhibit their applicability in a wide variety of sectors. Uh, for, for big data stack, for example, that's uh, shipping and, um, and insurance, but for policy pilots, different, um, different scenes of, of policy making and, and challenges addressed by uh, public administrations. So in their third and final year, the projects are ready to demonstrate the developed and implemented technologies uh, to the interested users from industry, technology providers, and, and for further uptake. And then the recently started Policy Cloud project, so we, we started in January 2020, uh, will highlight the adoption of technologies that are already developed by the more mature uh, big data stack uh, project. So really showcasing application for the policy making sector. So just a quick overview of who, what they're building, what these projects are actually building. So uh, Big Data Stack is building a holistic stack for big data applications and operations. Uh, IBDAS is building the industrial driven big data as a self uh, service. Uh, track and know big data for mobility tracking knowledge and extraction in urban areas. And Policy Cloud has already said cloud for data driven policy management. So they're really, really joining forces uh, to foster further adoption and to contribute to, to Europe's digital future. So this is the series here. You can see that we're, uh, we've uh, embarked uh, already. Uh, we have uh, a series of nine uh, webinars. Uh, today is the fifth. Um, and all sh they're all uh, already uh, online. So you can, you can consult the slides and the recordings and they give you a good overview of what, of what these projects have to offer for industry and, and, uh, and beyond. So today, uh, Policy Cloud will release uh, the European Cloud for Data-Driven Policy Management. So um, that's what we're building. Um, so this will provide integrated reusable models and analytical, analytical tools which turn raw data into valuable and actionable knowledge. Uh, the purpose of this webinar is really to demonstrate ongoing work with one of our policy pilot uh, use cases uh, that's policy uh, policies against radicalization and specifically the presenters will discuss how analytics can be used to segment radicalization efforts demographically visualize radicalization trends and assign risk profiles to individual suspects so um this is, uh, you'll know, you know now a little bit more about us and what we're going to do, but we also wanted to know who you are. Uh, so to get an understanding uh, what your backgrounds are and where you're, uh, you know, who you, in, in which organizations you, you operate. So for this, we, we have uh, an online poll. Diego, can I ask you to, uh, to launch this poll? Okay, I'll launch it now. So we have a few simple questions, really. So to, to which of our stakeholder types do you belong? And we would like you to, to, uh, to answer this. Uh, so are you from Research Academia? Are you a policymaker? Are you from public administration, big data provider, big data technology provider, standardization body, other? So I see public administration already. Are you working with big data? It's the next question. Some of you are very quick already. So half of you say that you're working with big data, the other half no. So we have people from research and academia, public administration, big data providers. The research and academia are growing. Okay. So a lot of you are working with big data. And then the third question is, are you interested in big data technologies to optimize your customer experience? A lot of you have said yes and uh,
a lot of you have indicated that it's the lack of expertise. Um, and then would you be interested in implementing a cloud-based solution for data-driven policymaking like Policy Cloud? A lot of people have said yes. Uh, let me see, 38%, 8% no, and 54% doesn't know that yet. So let's see. Do you have the necessary skills in your organization needed to operate a solution like Policy Cloud? Okay, so yes, a lot of you do, and some of you don't. So 38% not yet. Okay, so I think this is the end of the first poll. We have a few more questions for you lined up. Uh, I think we've, we've ended with 62% of you being from Michigan Academia, 8% from public administration, 8% from big data providers, 15% of big data technology providers, and 15% other. Okay, that's nice, good. Okay, so let's end the poll and let's get started with, uh, with Armand. Armand Dusa, can you, uh, while you are uh, starting to set up your presentation, I'll be briefly presenting you. So Armand Dusa, project manager and research associate at Majoli Group, um, involved in the coordination and management, monitoring and controlling dissemination expectation of the multiple R&D projects co-funded by the European Union under the various framework programs. Uh, you are particularly involved in health, well-being, active aging domain, cloud computing and software technologies domain, cyber physical risk assessment and management domain. You hold a, he holds a uh, Master of Science in Economics and Market Policy and a Bachelor in Business Administration and Management and is an active member of the Project Management Institute uh, in Northern Italy branch and of the European Association of Research Managers and Administrators. So Armand, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Marie. Uh, good afternoon also from my side. Uh, so, uh, this afternoon I'm going to provide you uh, a general overview first of the radicalization phenomenon, just to get you familiar with these concepts, uh, because maybe not all of you are uh, from the policy making or the public administration. And uh, as we saw also from the, the first pool, we have more people from the research and academia and technical providers and then we will focus on the uh, requirements analysis uh, so for both from the user perspective and data uh, perspective uh, so just to start up with uh, a very brief uh, introduction to the to the radicalization concept um, radicalization for uh, just uh, Okay, sorry, because we are in a, a, a common uh, room with other colleagues. So, uh, as I, I was saying, so radicalization, there are different definitions of radicalization. We have selected one very common and uh, universal uh, definition that has been provided by the United Nations Office uh, of Counterterrorism. So, they defined the radicalization as a process through which individuals uh, and uh, of course, we have also in included a group of individuals because what we have seen lately in the last years, uh, we have more active uh, groups, extremist groups that are working, uh, let's say, on this direction. And uh, so they are adopting an increasingly extremist set of beliefs or aspiration. And uh, this may include, uh, for example, the willingness to condone, to support, to facilitate, or to use uh, uh, of the violence to further political, ideological, and religious or other goals. Uh, of course, as I said, so this is one of the definitions. Um, what we have seen, for example, from many uh, member states or also European organization, that uh, what we are focusing more is only, let's say, on the concept of radicalization, uh, uh, let's say, linked to violent radicalization or radicalization that is leading to, to terrorism. But in our, let's say, uh, use case we want to to keep the the, the 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 definition that has been provided by the united uh, nation as it is more large 
research and uh, let's say uh, allows the policymaker to to analyze and to take into consideration uh, various elements and uh, let's say parameters that can help him to to validate uh, the existing policies and evaluate if there is a need to to draft or to to design new policies and uh, yeah so the the next point we uh, so when when we talk about uh, radicalization uh, we talk uh, about different areas or different domains when uh, this uh, let's say processes or this uh, uh, let's say uh, effects comes into account more frequently uh, but this is of course not limited the other the say uh, domains that uh, of course can be somehow linked to the to the radicalization but these are the, the say the main ones uh, that we are also focusing in our use case so we are talking about the prisons and uh, jurisdiction uh, system the migration hotspots and uh, asylum centers the schools uh, religions uh, communities uh, the peri-urban uh, contents and internet and media. Uh, another aspect very important when we discuss, when let's say we, we deal with policies in the uh, let's say related to the radicalization is uh, the the, uh, the different actors that are involved. Uh, in this, uh, let's say, in this domain. So we have different levels of policy makers from the local. Uh, so we have the municipalities, the social services, uh, and then we go to the, uh, to the national level with the ministries or in, uh, European level with uh, uh, director general uh, from uh, home, uh, 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 radicalization awareness network, uh, network and also Europol. And also at the international level, we have the United Nations Office for Counterterrorism and also the uh, Interpol. Other important stakeholders that uh, somehow uh, are linked or let's say can contribute to the to the design and uh, to the validation of these uh, policies uh, to counter and prevent uh, radicalization are of course the the law and uh, enforcement agencies. So uh, uh, police officers and uh, uh, the schools, uh, from the school principal, the teachers and other, let's say, uh, in, uh, actors involved in the school environment, uh, non-governmental organizations, so social workers, but also EU associations and initiatives like the uh, European Forum for Urban Security, European Crime Prevention Network and European Neighborhood Watch Association. Uh, what are the main goals that we want, let's say, to achieve in policy crowd? So, uh, and this is also linked to, uh, to the, let's say, to the direct objectives of the policymaker also uh, outside, let's say, or let's say at their daily operation. So what they want to achieve is to reduce the occurrence of domestic radicalization by early identifying warning signals and risks from the social media and other data sources, to promote the secure access to the public spaces for more people enriching their perception of security and safety, and also to encourage the citizen engagement and trust in the perceived le legitimacy of public authorities so um, different levels as we saw before so from the, from the municipalities to the regions but also law enforcement agencies uh, and then we have also um, let's say tracked the the main uh, objectives uh, from again from the policymaker perspective that we want to achieve within policy cloud. Uh, so these are the usage of uh, heterogeneous data sources to understand uh, hidden partners and new trends. So when we are talking uh, about heterogeneous data sources, we are talking about uh, data coming from social media uh, like uh, Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, but also RSS feeds for, so from different, let's say, websites sites and, and blog spots that can provide us uh, useful information and, and try to understand uh, what are the, the let's say the, the potential risks or trends that uh, are, can be linked to uh, radicalization efforts 
and then of course to extract, analyze and classify this information based on defined ontologies to generate useful insights about radicalization uh, incidents to create measurable uh, key performance indicators in order to allow the policymaker to, uh, uh, let's say, to validate the, uh, the existing policies and uh, understand if there is a need to design new policies or uh, to keep the existing policies, but uh, most probably to update them in order to, uh, to tackle uh, specific challenges or speci uh, specific, uh, let's say, uh, trends or informations that uh, up to today, they uh, were not, uh, let's say, available to the policymaker. And uh, based uh, on these uh, KPIs also, um, uh, so there is uh, one side, there is the, let's say, the, the performance measurement, but on the other side is also the, uh, the design and, the, uh, and, and definition of uh, suitable means and countermeasures to prevent radicalization. Uh, in, in this slide, you can see youth radicalization because uh, the main focus, the main criticality that uh, our policy makers uh, are aiming to tackle is the radicalization uh, uh, among uh, vulnerable individuals. So uh, let's say young individuals. Uh, uh, so that is the, the main reason why we are focusing on the youth radicalization. But of course, the concept and uh, the, the, the technologies that uh, are provided by uh, policy cloud can be extended to other domains and other challenges that may arise by the, the policymaker and also to contrast the, the spreading of extremism among uh, let's say among these uh, those detained and the last that uh, I already mentioned somehow because this is already linked to objectives number three is to evaluate the impact of these uh, new implemented policies compared to the old ones. So when we um, discuss about new policies, we, this can be the policies that are created uh, from scratch uh, from the information that are retrieved from uh, these different data sources and the policymaker uh, this, uh, decision uh, uh, thinks that uh, this is uh, interesting to be uh, included but also we have also the other case when the policies are not um, uh, let's say uh, cancelled, uh, uh, but are somehow customized or advanced uh, or updated in order to address the new challenges, the new information that uh, up to today there, uh, it was not available to the policymaker. Some of the application scenarios linked to this use case. Uh, so the first one uh, from, let's say, from the different discussion with the policy makers uh, uh, around, let's say, our uh, area and um, in our region is uh, the visualization. So uh, what the policy makers are really interested in uh, and they really want to have from uh, a tool, a digital tool like Policy Cloud, it to have the, the possibility to visualize the, the frequency of occurrences of these incidents uh, targeting vulnerable uh, groups. Uh, and uh, for example, in the geographic pro uh, proximity of the town or the region, but not only, also to see the different trends and poles of uh, radicalization incidents among Europe. And another, uh, let's say, very interesting scenario and uh, very requested from the policymakers is also the possibility to uh, to have or, or to detect new entities. And uh, by entities, we we mean individuals or organized group that somehow contribute to the creation of communication strategies in order to spread both online or offline um, radicalization efforts. Uh, or an alternative to narrative or counter narrative. Uh, so going back to the most, uh, let's say, uh, so how we translated these uh, requirements uh, uh, from the user perspective 
to the to more functional and data requirements so from the perspective of the functional requirements we have uh, users uh, so users by users we mean the policy maker the, the, there is a need for opinion and opinion mining analysis sentiment uh, analysis and uh, hierarchical text mining and from the data requirements so we have um, we have to guarantee access to the global terrorism database or as we already mentioned before different social media uh, social media networks like twitter facebook reddit but also uh, official websites and blog posts that provide uh, content uh, useful to to these domains that uh, somehow can we can provide or retrieve useful information from the policy maker in order to validate the uh, the existing policies and uh, so the process that we followed uh, within the project and uh, i just wanted to mention that the project uh, started uh, uh, on January 2020 so we are uh, let's say uh, right now at the end of month six so we already performed uh, a user requirements analysis and elicitation uh, procedure in order also to allow uh, uh, the, the, the technical partners uh, to the um, to the early and rapid prototyping of the different technologies uh, that will be developed uh, within the context of the policy cloud project uh, so as we already mentioned before so there is the first requirements uh, about the data analysis uh, in near real time and so uh, here the, the 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 end user the policy maker will decide the frequency of uh, of uh, let's say when, um, how frequent this uh, analysis will be performed. So at the at the beginning, we we defined that uh, a good timing might be uh, a weekly uh, uh, analysis of these different data sources. But of course, we will define uh, together with the policymaker when we start the validation of the different tools uh, so if there is a need or we see that the the amount of data that is coming from the social uh, media networks or other sources is uh, is very uh, high so we can increase the frequency of this analysis from weekly maybe to daily or some other let's say uh, based on the on the needs of the our end users uh, we go we continue with uh, another requirements that we already Already saw before in the previous slides so there is um, the visualization uh, so the users are requiring that uh, the dashboard should should provide to them information uh, in a different format in order to allow uh, them to identify quickly the different areas uh, or the different poles of radicalization, um, uh, let's say phenomena within, let's say, close to their um, to their uh, to their area, but also in other uh, geographic areas. Even they are not very close, but as we know, the um, uh, say the the technology today as as provides to the to to the different users the ability to inter connect and uh, organize in uh, in very very rapidly so uh, also uh, we consider other let's say uh, active groups or individuals even if they are not very close to to our uh, specific policy maker but somehow uh, we want to capture also or uh, uh, predict uh, somehow the link between the, the the domestic groups or individuals with with uh, other groups active uh, around Europe or uh, at international level. And uh, yeah, linked also to the visualization, as I already mentioned, there is also the risk prediction because um, it is not just a matter of visualizing uh, the existing or what, at, uh, what let's say, uh, what are the incident that already has occurred, uh, even let's say in a time horizon uh, from uh, five to ten years before 
today, but we want uh, the, say, the, the policy maker would like also to see or um, uh, let's say the, the system should provide to him uh, some uh, useful hints or information in order to, to predict uh, different risks or threats uh, of, uh, of uh, radicalization incidents that can happen in their location or close to their location. And uh, the last one uh, is uh, the extraction of, of new entities, as we mentioned also in the previous slide. So when uh, by new entities, we, we mean extremism groups or individuals that, uh, that were unknown to the, to the policymaker up to today. And of course, uh, we are also interested about their location, not because uh, we want uh, to, to track them in the sense that uh, if they are close, uh, they are more relevant to the policymaker. And so we can provide a higher level of impact that they can have to the, to the policy uh, decision maker uh, at, uh, at the local level. Uh, but of course, we are interested also about uh, groups uh, or individuals that uh, are active, even they, they are not very, let's say, close to the to the our policymaker, because there is this interconnection uh, uh, at let's say at the real time that, uh, of course, can somehow affect the level of security at the at the at the level of the municipality. So this uh, closes my presentation for today. I don't know if there are any questions from your side, if you have uh, any uh, specific interest or something that you wanted to, to, to know more in detail, because of course the time uh, is limited, so we cannot uh, spend so much time in each of the slides of for different topics, but uh, feel free to, to make any question if you have any. Thanks, Armand, thanks. Yeah, so just to remind everybody that the questions, you can also answer, uh, add them to Q&A. Uh, so that we can see them and we, we, we can answer them at the, at the, at the end. Uh, so if there are no questions at this moment, then I would like to thank Armen, thank you. Uh, and I would like to move on to uh, Pavlos Granas. No, sorry. Uh, I would like to ask Diego for the poll uh, because we have some more questions uh, related to the, the presentation of Armen now. Yes, I will uh, share. To understand, yes. Yes, I will share the link where you can vote on the chat and after I will share naturally the screen for a more clear overview. Yeah, sorry, Pavlos, we, we are going to do the poll for a second, so Diego will share his screen. Because we have some questions related to our men's uh, earlier presentation. So if you go to slide.com. Yes. So we're waiting for the screen to be, yes, perfect. So are you dealing with any challenges to be addressed uh, with evidence-based policy making? So one of you have already said not at the moment, okay, that means it could be happening in the future sometime uh, as well. Any other, so you, you have to join slido.com and then you have to enter uh, 13181. Yeah, the link are two, seems one, but are two link for two questions. Okay. So uh, that's also very possible to just add the question in the, in the chat. I would be interested to know a little more about the Global Terrorism Database. So Jerry Smith, we'll, we'll take your question uh, when we've done the, the poll, okay? And then uh, so how, the second question is, 
are you dealing with any, the first question is, are you dealing with any challenges to be addressed? Okay. And how are you currently addressing these challenges? Is the next question. So, So if you go to slido.com and you enter hashtag 13181, then you can answer this question. No? Okay, okay. so then, let's, uh, then there's a question for you, Armand. Uh, maybe you can, do you want to take it now for a yeah. second? Yeah, of yeah? course. So, so there's a... Yeah. I would be interested to know a little more about the global terrorism database. Where do you get the data and how do you access it and how are you using it? Yeah, so actually the, the global terrorism database is an open, uh, open database uh, that is supported, let's say, from the University of Maryland in, uh, in College Park. And uh, they are collecting data from 1970 to today. So we have different, let's say, uh, domains that, uh, or different uh, aspects of the radicalization uh, that we can have useful information from this database. So for example, terrorism and violent extremism, uh, counter-terrorism and countering violent extremism, risk communication and resilience. So from this database, uh, we, we see the different uh, radicalization uh, incidents that can happen from 1970 from today with uh, useful information uh, and different elements that can be uh, useful for the policymaker to understand with, for example, which was the group or the individual that uh, uh, initiated this, uh, this uh, radicalization incident, uh, what, for example, was the attack time Type, what was the what was the objective of this uh, attack type so what was the entity that at the end was very affected by this kind of attack sometimes can be also an individual so not just uh, an entity uh, can be for example one of the uh, embassies or i don't know an ngo that is working uh, with uh, the different uh, users and uh, from these attacks can be uh, somehow uh, affected or there are also the, uh, in the attack types you can have also useful information of the of the weapons or uh, for example uh, they have um, you, uh, detailed information on chemical or biological threats or radiological and nuclear threats uh, bombing uh, and so different elements very useful and elements uh, this is just a matter of uh, let's say for the policymaker to decide what kind of information he wants to, to filter in order to, to, uh, to analyze and uh, to be retrieved by, uh, as we said before during the presentation, to decide the frequency uh, and uh, yeah, to have this uh, information. So uh, where do you get the data and how do you access it and are you using it? Yeah. So, um, the, the database allow us to to download the data uh, <laughs> locally, or we can uh, question the database through an API. So uh, the system asks ask the database uh, to, to provide specific information that, for example, uh, one of the queries can be uh, specify, or we want to know what are the radicalization efforts that are happening close to Milan area. And so uh, the system will provide as a result, the different uh, radicalization, uh, the let's say, uh, events that can happen in the area of Milan from 1970 to today. And of course, the query can be more uh, specific. So the policymaker can also include other interested keywords or other uh, interested information that he is very interested in. So I don't know if this covered your question or you wanted something more particular also to know.
So, so let me uh, for a second unmute Jerry so he can answer if that was in the, oh yes, that is great. Thank you, okay. he says. Thank okay, you. perfect. I, I see there's one uh, hand uh, risen. So um, Kostas Mutsalas, um, we take your question after the presentation of Pavlos uh, Kranas because uh, otherwise we will be pressed for time at the end. So we will, we will come back to your question. Uh, so if you want to put it in the Q&A, we can already see it. Uh, otherwise, I will unmute you after Pavlos presentation. Thank you. So Pavlos, uh, while you are getting ready to share your uh, screen uh, for uh, the presentation, I'll briefly present you. Uh, so Pavlos Kranas is a senior software engineer at Linux Scale uh, with a focus on distributed and database management systems and his experience in software development and project management. Uh, Deputy Technical Coordinator of the InfiniTag flagship project and a technology provider in Big Data Stack, as already mentioned before, as well as in Policy Cloud. Uh, so, uh, Pavlos, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, I'm going to quickly uh, uh, set the technical overview of uh, the Policy Cloud and then go into more details as uh, specific, specific components that we have in, developed in the scope of big data stack and we want to break into in the, in the policy cloud. So, uh, as Mariek said uh, at the very beginning, what is the target objective of the project is to provide an analytics as a service, let's say, to, in order to facilitate uh, the efficient data-driven public policy management. So what is the background now? So the facts are the following, that uh, nowadays you have increasing use of devices and networks. So this uh, leads to uh, gener the generation of vast quantities of data. So uh, what is becoming the norm? The norm is uh, leaking this data from uh, all these devices, this new big data that we produced uh, with uh, existing and established data sources. So uh, <clears throat> the current approach is uh, not evidence-based, and that does not take in uh, this uh, data linking uh, into account. So mature approaches needs to analyze and understand this, uh, the, the whole environment that uh, is defined by the, the, data, the data produced by all these kind of devices and networks. So the goal is to create uh, efficient and effective policies with uh, data-driven policy management into account that we can manage all this kind of data and to uh, provide decision support authorities for public so for policy modeling, implement, implementation and simulation through the identified populations. Uh, so we have five main challenges here in the project that we have been uh, structured hierarchically, let's say, one leads to the other. So first of all, the, main, uh, the first main challenge is that uh, we need a data-driven approach for effective policy management. So we have uh, various uh, sources of data data coming from a lot of uh, different uh, sources, and we manage uh, uh, the whole uh, data path, which includes data modeling, representation, interoperability of data coming from uh, different sources, cleaning, uh, linked heterogeneous uh, data set, analytics on top of all of them, in order to explore the collective knowledge, uh, <coughs> or the, the, the data coming from all these different sectors. Uh, <coughs> But uh, as we said that we have the, we, based on the data because data is gold nowadays and uh, we have a compilation assessment optimization in the multi-domain of policy. We have, it's very important to, to highlight here that uh, we, many of the partners uh, in this project also was participating in a previous one that was uh, started uh, uh, tackling uh, policies but in a specific domain of the healthcare. Right now we are uh, having uh, multiple domains and we try to have the, elastic, the holistic policy uh, modeling. So we have different KPIs from, uh, from specific policies that are targeting a specific sector. And what we need to do, and the uh, main challenge here is to, analyze, to make an analysis of uh, potential patterns, let's say, and uh, relations between policies in different uh, domains. So we can have the identification of effective uh, KPIs that can be reused in other type of policies or which are not, a, not a effective and taking into account that we know what uh, the first are effective, we can also help improve uh, the non-effective ones. Uh, the third main challenge is the data management techniques that uh, we enforce across the complete uh, data path. So we try to have a meta interpretation, let's say, layer that uh, helps to semantically uh, annotate and uh, capture the, the syntactic of the data properties, the meaning, and the representation 
And also we have uh, in, the, in, the, in the data path, we have also mechanisms for cleaning the data, for uh, harmonizing it, uh, fusing it, and uh, in order to be able to be into this uh, interpret meta -interpret interpretation layer. Uh, also, on top of that, there comes the analytics. So we have uh, the analytics as a service. So it's an it's an analytical tool can be reusable by uh, targeting different data sets. So we have machine deep learning techniques for classification, regression, clustering, and all the things that uh, you can imagine. Infer new data and load knowledge, and we have and we also the <coughs> and technologies and the tools being as uh, as a service means that allow us to be decoupled from the exactly from the specific data sets. So usually you, you, you build an analytical tool and you target a specific data set in order to extract the knowledge that you are concerned of. But decoupling this information, you can uh, reuse it uh, to other target uh, sources. And at the very end, we provide a unit endpoint to exploit the analytics in these different cases that uh, this uh, can execute, uh, first of all, you can uh, model the policies, but uh, policies have the uh, specific APIs, and then uh, you can execute different models that uh, actually uh, invoke the execution of the analytical tools underneath. And also the results uh, can be visualized, as Armin was saying before, uh, in an adaptive and incremental uh, manner. So this uh, enables the policy lifecycle to be visualized in different kind of ways according to what uh, uh, its tool is, uh, is uh, concerned of. And also because we are also targeting uh, streaming uh, scenarios, we can have this incremental visualization. So it means that uh, the result that you can see on the screens can be modified on the fly and uh, you can uh, readjust the policy. So this is the conceptual architecture, let's say, of the whole project. It's very important to note uh, right now that the project is at the very beginning. So this is, uh, uh, so this is a working project, a uh, work in progress. So this is the first idea that we I came up, but so I don't get into more details because still we are involved in that, but it's very important to see that we have a separation of the layers. So at the very, very bottom, we have, let's say, the infrastructure layer. So this means that the whole solution can be deployed automatically in different uh, environments. And you can see the separation then of, of, uh, of, uh, of the layers. So we have the data acquisition, the targets is the data management part. So this is, let's say, the, the management of the complete data path that we were discussing before, how the data enters, being, uh, being cleaned, uh, uh, get uh, quality assessment, and changed uh, in order to extract semantic and syntactic uh, information so that the data can be interoperable. We have link, we have the fusion, data fusion linking stored in the, the data store. And then on top of that, we have the data analytics that, as I said, we said we are, they are implemented in a, as a service approach. So they have analytics for opinion mining, sentiment analysis, social dynamics, et cetera, et cetera, that can be used in different kind of, uh, of, uh, of data sets. So it's, you can see that it's not uh, targeting a specific one, but uh, you can uh, be reused in different domains. And on top of that, of course, we have uh, uh, the policy creation and the modeling, and the policy modeling, and, and the, uh, that drives the results to the visualization. So uh, right now, uh, as we implement uh, this project, we decided that uh, it would be very meaningful to uh, include some technologies that uh, we have already implemented in the scope of uh, Big Data Stack. So in the policy cloud, it's uh, Linux scale and IBM are two uh, partners that are the main data technology providers that uh, we have uh, implemented a baseline technology in the scope of Big Data Stack that uh, there that we identified that they need to have the solution and we have already uh, provided the first uh, prototype. Uh, Big Data Stack is a project that is uh, ends in the end of uh, the year but still we are identified that uh, the scenarios that uh, we are targeting are, uh, are, uh, can be, are very common. So we need to also to, to continue that uh, in the scope of, uh, of Police Cloud. So what is the essence of this framework? So nowadays the modern enterprises uses a variety of different kind of uh, data stocks uh, management systems. You can have operational database to manage transactional uh, load. You can have key value to add the store uh, IoT data, looks for the traffic, or for the uh, network traffic. You can have data warehouses for analytics, data legs to store and uh, structural data, etc. So you need uh, actually your framework to provide you uh, uh, polyglot capabilities. This means that be able to speak with different languages. 
but uh, then it's better if the database system can be able to provide that. Uh, nowadays, we can usually have uh, data federation using tools like uh, Apache Spark, which is uh, very, very common right now. But uh, the main, uh, the main, the main drawback is uh, as they are not a database uh, themselves. Uh, they can, they need to actually take the data in, uh, on memory and, and uh, provide there the analysis, which can be very resource-consuming. And of course, you cannot explain the capabilities of each of uh, specific data stores. So we were targeting a use case when uh, data ingesting into an operational data store coming from sensor data coming from uh, IoT devices. But at the very end, the old data can become uh, historical, which means there's no modifications anymore and you don't have any transactional uh, uh, need for transactional semantics of that. So you put it in a data warehouse in order to perform analytics, big data volumes that the data warehouses are uh, identical for that. But the distribution of the data set can be problematic because data have to be retrieved from both of the stores and have to be merged in the application level, which is something that is very, very difficult to be done in that, in that level. And this is what the databases are good for it. Um, but uh, also, you can also have uh, considerations about the data consistency when moving data from one the, the data to the other. So uh, our solution is this seamless analytical framework that actually federates data coming from two different data stores. It's one is a relational data store of Linux scale, and the other is the analytical data store, the object store of IBM. Both of them share the same data set. So uh, the data set are split between the two of them, and even if uh, data man coexist, we provide the insurance that the data user, the data analysis, could see uh, uh, the specific data, the logical data set uh, as it is. You can see it as a single black box for the data for the application developer, for the data analyst, and consists internally of two different stores that uh, allows you to expose now the unique characteristics of each one. So the, uh, the analytical behavior of the object store and the operational behavior of uh, the relational one. So this can be transparent from the user, the data moves from one to the other without uh, the, the, the interference of the data administrator and we cannot uh, not compromise the requirements for the benefits of the others. So both of them, uh, sure, you can have the operational and the analytical processing uh, as you had it before. Uh, query federation has been done uh, inside the Linux scale uh, engine. So you can see here the Linux scale in the object store that uh, can communicate through this uh, federator. And this uh, can be done because uh, the object store is also integrated with the Apache Spark that uh, with the thrift can provide the JDBC interface. And but you can see that from the application perspective, everything is, uh, is can be can be seen as a logical database, and you can directly invoke the queries as before. And this is a very high level uh, level. I'm not going to get into the details, but of course we have questions there. I can answer whatever you want. You have you can see there the two. Of the, of the database, the federator of, of, of top, and you have this element that gets the, the, the data slice from the, when it's come uh, uh, historical, from the one to the other. We have, there is a data manager that orchestrates the whole process, and, uh, and, you, and uh, what the important here is that as uh, data is moved from one to the other, we ensure the, the data consistency. Uh, so uh, the important thing here is that uh, 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 getting uh, data from an analytical warehouse, uh, it's, uh, can be, it's, very, it's, it's a very complex situation. So that's why uh, IBM has developed the data skipping technology that actually uh, provides you a lot of accelerator, acceleration when accessing data in the object store. So this is uh, the scenario that uh, we were dealing in, uh, in the big data stack when we have, uh, uh, let's say, the, a vessel in the left corner that provides uh, uh, IoT data that comes into the system, and you can see in the in the yellow box the different components that uh, that is being uh, involved in the seamless analytical framework. We have the Linux scale database, the data mover that takes data slice from one to the other, and the object store that goes through the Spark. So here, the IBM has developed uh, his, uh, functional, this functionality, this innovative functionality, which is called data skipping. It actually uh, provides you a lot of acceleration, and without that. Even if the seamless analytical framework could work, it could work not that efficiently, so it means that it will not be that, uh, that useful, useful. So we have uh, the data skipping is relevant for SQL queries. 
So if we are, for example, we have a select statement from a table when we apply a filter operation. So we have a, we have a scan operation on the table when we filter out the attributes that have the value of the one screen more than 30. We, this is implemented for Apache Spark, and it's up to the latest version, which is the, until now, this is supported is the 3.0. It is a dialogue technology, but as she said, it's nicely complement the seamless component, but because without that, even we can access data from the object store, uh, the we would like this uh, acceleration, so the results would be very, very slow. So how, how it works? Let's say here we have uh, all the objects that, uh, that are stored into the object store. And we, we, set, uh, we execute an SQL query, so the SQL query should uh, try to, uh, to scan the whole lot of the items and apply the filter operation. So the data skipping uh, mechanism, what it does, it determines which objects are not relevant to this query, so it can avoid it when, when it scans. So it stores indexes, uh, <coughs> index met, uh, combined, uh, getting metadata for uh, each of these objects, so during the scan, it skips the irrelevant objects. So it reduces the, um, the, num the number of the, uh, items that have been accessed, and the very the number of items that are going to be returned. So here, let's say we have we apply uh, the SQL query in the Apache Spark that inside they have the data skipping index, and this would allow us to only address the, uh, the uh, data elements that, that we need. So this saves us time and money, of course. So uh, this is, has been uh, mature until now. It was started in the, in the, in, during the project, but until now, but it also has been demonstrated in a, in a demo. It has been presented in the IBM Think of uh, last year conference, which is uh, one of the most important events that IBM is uh, organizing. So this is, uh, has a great impact and also has integrated an, uh, already as an open beta in the IBM uh, Cloud SQL query. And this is for, from me, and uh, Marek, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pavlos. Thank you for that presentation. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if there's any questions at the moment. I haven't seen yet. So I would really encourage everybody to, to add the questions that you have to uh, the Q&A uh, so that we can, uh, we can uh, answer them in the, at, at the end. Because now I would like to um, briefly give the floor to our invited uh, speaker. Let me share my screen. So, um, just briefly about what you just uh, learned about policies uh, against radicalization. If you want to hear more, uh, I mean, after we've done uh, the Q&A, uh, we have a very nice podcast about uh, about exactly this uh, this pilot study as well. So fighting radicalization with data. So I really recommend that you listen to it when you have a, a quiet moment. Uh, it's uh, it's really a joy to listen to. So um, please uh, visit our website and you can you can find it. And uh, also the QR code will take you to it. Even the SoundCloud link there. So uh, yeah, go and go and listen to it. Then uh, I would like to ask uh, Ana, uh, Athanasios Kumparos uh, to, uh, to uh, take the floor. Uh, just briefly about uh, why Athanasios is joining us. So as, as already said in the beginning, we, have, uh, we are a joint uh, effort between uh, four projects. So Big Data Stack, IBDAS, Track and Know, and Policy Cloud. So now I've been wearing two hats, Policy Cloud, Big Data Stack, also Pavlos did. Uh, then you see some of our panelists are also very mixed. So we are uh, Big Data Stack, uh, Diego, um, Simoni, and uh, we, you see Esther uh, there as well. She's from Policy Cloud. And now I would like to give the floor to Ana, uh, Athanasios Kumparos to invite you to the next webinar in this series, which is a, a very nice joint effort that we're, uh, that we're having. Athanasios, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, thank you, Marek. Can you share my, my script, my presentation? Yes, I, I'm, I'm showing your presentation. Ah, okay, okay. So, uh, hello everybody, I'm Athanas Kumbaros. I will, I'm working at uh, Vodafone Novus. It's a satire of uh, Vodafone. 
For the next uh, webinar, which is on the 7th of July, I will be talking about the Trikino project, and especially one of the pilots of the Trikino project, which is related to the fleet management uh, case. Um, I will go into more details about the use cases that the fleet management uh, has a, is trying to solve in the Trikino project. And I will try to demo two of the most uh, important and basic uh, cases in the right in the fleet management case, where it's a, where I discuss about the error detection of the data coming from a vehicle the device and how this data is cleansed and how we can use the kind of data in order to predict the next location of the vehicle and act upon it before this vehicle arrives at a, any given point. So I hope to see you all next next week on the seventh, and that's it for me. The floor is yours. Thank you all. Thank you. So um, what I would like to Marik, sorry, there is uh, another question uh, from the participants, and I think it's linked to my presentation. So Perfect. do you want me to, uh, yes. to take it also? Yes, yeah. please do. So, yeah, there is a question from Yosef. Um, so he's saying, a nice webinar. Are you not afraid that the project outcomes could be used by authoritarian regimes to detect and repress various groups of citizens, e.g., uh, for example, political opponents in Iran, etc.? Okay, so first of all, thank you, Yosef, for this question because uh, it's a, a really interesting question. Um, what I wanted to to clarify, first of all, is that uh, the project, as uh, we also mentioned at the beginning of this uh, webinar, but also during our presentation, has just started. So we are in month six, and so uh, we expect that the the uh, the, uh, the more uh, advanced outcomes of the project will be available uh, in two and a half years from now and of course some uh, of the results of the project will be available uh, as open source but some others will be available uh, let's say as a, a commercial product so uh, let's say not of the results of the project will be accessible by, uh, for free. So uh, in this case, uh, I'm, I'm not sure because we, we just started, let's say, the, also the exploitation and sustainability plan for the project, but I'm, I, I'm not sure, uh, let's say, I'm quite sure that there is, uh, for example, for this specific use case, uh, this will be, um, will be released as a commercial product and uh, of course we will negotiate let's say with the potential customers what can be the usage of this uh, of these outcomes from the project uh, and how these outcomes can support them in their daily life uh, operation uh, so of course we are not going to uh, Iranian government, for example, uh, in order to follow up with this uh, comment, because uh, our main target uh, customers will be, first of all, around Europe, because this is a European project. And so we want to have a higher impact in, among European countries. But uh, nevertheless, this does not avoid other customers outside Europe, to, uh, let's say, if they are interested to, to acquire such solutions like Policy Cloud or other solutions that maybe are also available in the market to, 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 say, to have also this uh, conversation. But uh, these are somehow also linked to, let's say, that, that goes beyond the project itself. So we cannot 100% uh, assure that who will be the, say, the, the end user of the, of the platform uh, in, let's say, from here to, to three years will make the use uh, that we uh, are building the tools. So we are building the tools in order to identify uh, extremist groups or in, uh, organized groups or uh, individuals that are organizing such activities that in, in some extent can lead to radicalization. Uh, our focus is not the opposite 
or uh, um, let's say to allow uh, governments at any level of let's say of uh, of governance or so local regional national level uh, to adapt the, uh, the the tools to to their needs but uh, of, it is out of our intention and uh, the scope of the project to provide uh, to the governments uh, you uh, these tools for their uh, let's say needs uh, in terms of political repressing political groups or uh, other groups that are, are not sharing the same ideas and thoughts as as the government so uh, i hope this somehow uh, uh, let's say covers your question because it is a very difficult question at this point because as i said we just started but uh, and it is also not easy to 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 reassure that this will not happen in the in the near future but uh, yeah So, Marik, uh, the floor is back to you. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, so, uh, I don't know if there's, uh, thank you, Armand. Uh, I don't know if there's any other questions. Uh, at this moment, I can't see any new ones in the question and answer box. Uh, I do have a question though. I know we're, we're over time. We then uh, close off if there are no other questions. Um, so, these this, the tools that we're building is for public administration and policy makers but what kind of skills what kind of roles do they need to have in their organization so i think maybe that question is more for pavlos can you repeat marek because i don't understand the context yeah so what kind of uh, experts would they need in their organization to be able to make uh, the policy cloud uh, solution work in their organization, the skills that are needed? Ah, uh, actually, we does, uh, we, because we uh, provide all this automation, it doesn't uh, require a lot of skills. So, okay, of course, a technical uh, uh, a guy that can handle operations so can be able to uh, deploy everything, but everything is automated and as soon as everything is deployed, then it's just about the end user to, to use it. So the, also the, the tools that are being provided, the analytical tools, are also comes with, with all of that. But okay, of course, if you need to extend it because it's been developed, it's been okay. It will, it will be developed. Uh, it will be designed to be extendable. So if there is someone uh, that analyst there, he can also create the tool, and then it's a very very easy process to to plug it into the platform and it can be accessible from the whole of policy development tool. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Diego, do you see any questions in the question and answer box? Uh, not uh, at the moment. Not at the okay. moment. Okay. Uh, no hands risen. No, then I would like to, uh, to thank all the speakers uh, for their inspiring presentations, Armenduza, Pavlos Kranas, and also our invited speaker, Athanasius Kumparos. And thank you all for attending the webinar today. And uh, so we also would like to thank very much the uh, Big Data Value PPP uh, Summit 2020, who gave us this opportunity to, uh, to hold this series of webinars. Uh, so we are, um, would like to thank you again for joining and uh, have a wonderful rest of the day. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice thank day. you very much. Bye. 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 Thank you.